and tulip came after Calvin. This was, uh, these terminologies were invented to uh, support and associate with these men. But the whole idea behind it was even Arminianism. Arminius was also a Calvinist. Uh, he believed what Calvin did. But he, it all revolves around a state church system. I can't say that enough. And that is the whole idea and the concept behind it. But let's look here in Romans 11. And let's start in verse uh, 1. And we'll deal with the subject of, of election. Now, as I mentioned, it's only found six times in the Scripture. But the most of the occurrences are found in Romans 11 here. It said, verse 1, I say then, if God cast away his people, God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What know ye not that the Scripture saith of Elias, how he maketh intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets, they have digged down thine altars, and I am left alone, and they seek my life. But what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Now keep that phrase in mind, election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more of grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. So election hath obtained it. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, ears that they should not hear unto this day. And David saith, Lord, uh, David, let their table be made a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened that they may not see and bow down their back alway. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness, for I speak of the Gentiles, and as much as I'm the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. So let's go back to verse, uh, as we look here in verse uh, uh, 5, even so then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Now, do you all remember when I preached on the subject of gifts, and the gifts and, and grace are in reference to one another. The word um, grace is from the, the word that we get uh, charismas from or, char um, or charismatic or gift. Actual, in, in actuality, grace is a gift, but at the same time, it means the uh, divine influence upon the human heart. That's what grace is. So election is according, when you look in verse 5, it's according to the election of grace. So what God hath chosen, then we look at elect, that's what God hath chosen. So election is according to grace, which is the divine influence upon the human heart. So election, now I'm read verse 5 again. Even so then at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. There is a remnant, even though in, in, in uh, Elijah's day, uh, we had them worshiping false gods, there were not many of them. He said, Lord, I'm the only one left. And God said, no, there are 7,000 that have not bowed their knee to the image of Baal. And that was according to the election or the choice that God had of his method, the election of grace. Now, grace is the divine influence upon the human heart. So the process by which God will reserve people is according to uh, his divine influence upon their human heart. And the end result is that some will believe and some will not. So some will be hardened, some will be darkened in their ability to see, and some will say yes. And this is how that uh, a person has become the elect of God. And it's, it goes along with that a man has a free will and a man chooses as that divine influence now is impacting him, he makes a choice and a, either yes or no. So again, we understand that election is mentioned 
Six times in the Word of God, that's all that is mentioned. Election is, is listed six times. Now, when he mentions here the comparison between works and grace, so it's either going to be that a person works and God says, based on your work, you're chosen. Or God would say, no, rather than choosing who works, I choose the process by which man will become one of mine, and that is according to the, uh, the divine influence upon his heart and his reception of that truth and reception of God's divine influence upon him. So let's read verse 6. He said, if by grace, which is again the divine influence upon the human heart, so if by grace, that's what grace is, which is a gift, and it's where you get uh, charisma from, and it's a gift, it's a divine influence upon the human heart. So if by grace, if by this divine influence upon the human heart, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace or the divine influence is no more divine influence, so God has nothing to do with it. If it was by works, God would have nothing to do with it because grace is no more grace. So there's no divine influence upon your heart. It's all up to you what you do. And that is not how a man is saved. A man is saved according to the gift of grace. For by grace are ye saved through faith. So, you know, grace doesn't save us. Grace, in that famous verse of Ephesians 2, for by grace, grace is divine influence upon the human heart. For by grace are ye saved through faith, not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. So a man is not saved by his works because if he did, if he was, then grace is no more grace. There's no divine influence needed upon your heart because all you got to do is get up in the morning, go to church, do good things, work, read your Bible, pray. God has nothing to do with it. So really, God is not really much part of your salvation, is he, if that would be the case. But God hath not chosen that. So election is according to grace. Does this make sense? Election is according to grace. So it's called the election of grace. It isn't that God chose this guy to heaven, this guy to go to hell. What it is, and we believe in election. We believe in election that God has chosen the process by which he would save man. And that is, it would, be not, it would not be according to work. In reality, when you look at the Calvinists, they're a works-oriented organization. You look at Augustine, works-oriented. See, they believe this. If you're not coming in and taking communion and being, and being baptized into their, their assembly, and if you do not have a perpetual aspect of uh, being involved and supporting their institution, especially in the days of the Protestant Reformation, and the times of Augustinianism, when it was the Catholic Church now is developing and emerging. In reality, their works based, and they defy, and they go against, and they contradict what election of grace is, because they're eliminating the divine influence upon the human heart and putting it upon your obedience to the papacy, or your obedience to the federal religion that they had in their day. So in reality, it's, a, it's an oxymoron. They're totally against the grace of election of grace, which is God's divine influence upon the human heart, that really isn't part of their equation. Their equation is this, that get baptized as an infant, come in and maintain the communion and stay part of this organization. And if you do this, after the fact, you are one of God's elect. So really, the divine influence upon the human heart had no play in this because a baby didn't choose. A baby did not choose to be baptized according to God's divine influence upon his heart, compelling him, this is what you need to do. So Calvinism, Calvinist, and Calvinism really is opposite of what they say they are. You know, just as organizations out there have these different names, you know, they, they make themselves sound good uh, by their title, but in reality, they're the opposite of what they say they are. And, and that's how doctrine is as well. But look in verse uh, 6 now. And if by grace, which is the divine influence upon the human heart, then it is no more works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. In other words, if you can work it, you don't need God's influence upon your heart. Otherwise, work is no more work. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but election hath obtained it, 
and the rest were blinded. So election hath obtained it. Well, what is election? Election is according to foreknowledge. We know that. But look back in verse 5. So if election hath obtained this, verse 5, the remnant is according to the election of grace. So if election hath obtained it, how did election obtain it? Election obtained it through the divine influence of God upon the human heart. Therefore, the man had said yes. Now, I know in Calvinistic theology and their views, they believe that they talk about the irresistible, uh, irresistible grace where, uh, you know, the divine influence upon your heart, you can't say no. Well, you, you can because people have rejected Christ and they have rejected him. So uh, they're trying to to make this where it really isn't the divine influence upon the human heart, it would be simply divine uh, sanction. Uh, you know, so grace, we have to understand what grace is. It's, it's the divine influence upon the human heart. But if God simply had chosen it, so this is how it is, period, regardless, well, there's really no need for influence. It's just a matter of this is how it is, and uh, so forth. Uh, let's look at a couple of other uh, passages in regard to the subject of election. Uh, we see it in uh, Romans eleven twenty eight. Let's go to verse twenty eight. Romans eleven twenty eight. It says, uh, "As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as touching election, they are beloved for the Father's sake." Well, there's election as well. Again, in the context, and then we find First uh, Thessalonians one four and also Second Peter one ten, where it talks about your calling and election sure. And it's the divine influence upon your heart. So basically, let's go to 2 Peter 1.10. And let's just look at this one here. 2 Peter 1.10. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 10. Uh, we see, it says here, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. If you do these things, ye shall never fall. And when you look at the, the aspect of the, it, it, it's revolving itself around the subject of grace. But let's start in verse 1 and read the context. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. What's verse 2? What's the first word of verse 2? Grace. What is Grace. The divine influence upon the human heart. Now keep that in mind. Grace and election go hand in hand. So God's divine influence upon the human heart. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Now when you look at gifts in the Bible, it's, it, gifts are even according to the measure of grace. Or grace is according to the gift itself. As we have dealt with that in the previous uh, lesson, we have dealt with that. But... Nevertheless, we're going to see grace is always connected to election. And grace is the divine influence upon the human heart. So here's the divine influence upon the human heart as it follows. Grace and, uh, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and our Savior, Jesus our Lord. According as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him which has called, uh, called us to glory and virtue. Now, when you look in verse 2, it says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through knowledge. And then in verse 3, it talks about the divine power given to us all things pertaining unto life and godliness through the knowledge. So knowledge, here is how grace and peace multiply. So we understand the more we learn, the more of that divine influence of God upon our heart occurs. And, and so it's, exp it's expanding. And then it says... Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And besides all these, uh, all this, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue, virtue, knowledge, knowledge, temperance, temperance, patience, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So knowledge is how grace is multiplied. Now grace is given as a gift, but it's multiplied through knowledge. So God gives, God gives us the, uh, 
grace, because it's a gift of God, the grace of God that bringeth salvation to appear to all men. God hath given us as a gift His divine influence upon the human heart. It, and, and by God's goodness, grace is given. So God is good, therefore He gives grace to all men. God is gracious to every man. And that's according to His attribute that God is good. And God gives it. But grace is a gift. And we see then verse uh, 7, And to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. If these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which grace is multiplied. He that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off. Now remember the blind, we talked about that in Romans 11, where it said, you know, they were blinded. So God's divine influence upon the human heart and it's, ex it's expanded through knowledge of Him, and is, it's, it's expanded through knowledge the more we see, but yet the more we reject it and deny the knowledge and resist Him, we, we do despite to the Spirit of grace. We do despite of it, and then we fall from grace. Now, what you see there in Hebrews 12, where a man falls from grace and then loses salvation, what he is doing is losing the potency of God's divine influence upon his heart, where it doesn't matter anymore. You know, I really don't care anymore. I remember when God really had a hold of me, but I really don't care anymore. You have fallen from grace because the divine influence upon your human heart is swallowed up in your bitterness. Now, look what he says about your calling and election. He says in verse 10, Wherefore, rather, the brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure. If you do these things, you shall never fall. So that divine influence upon your heart, you can paralyze it. Go to Hebrews 12. Hebrews chapter 12, where we deal with the subject of the bitterness. In Hebrews 12, and we'll look in verse... Let's see here, Hebrews chapter 12, and we'll follow in verse uh, 13. And make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. In other words, a person has a, a wound of some kind, spiritually speaking or emotionally, whatever. Is, you know, so he's, he's using the, um, the parallel here, uh, parallel of a lame person be turned out of the way. And that, whatever happened, because in the previous verses, he's dealing with um, chastisement, you know, a, a wayward child. So people can get angry at God, and they often do. But he said, make straight paths for your feet. And then he says, verse 14, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. So when a man fails of the grace of God, which is, it is the election of grace, God hath chosen, the way God deals with man is not that God said, you, I'm going to let you work, and the more you work, the more you're accepted. No, it is, it's going to be according to my divine influence upon your heart. Now, this is done by the Holy Ghost of God. And so here we have a man falling or failing of the grace of God. Failing of the grace of God because of circumstances and bitterness in your life. And that which is lame is turned out of the way, but rather let it be healed. You know, never let that take you out of church, which never got you in church. All right? So a lot of folks, they let things get them out of church that never got them in. Now, what got you in was God's divine influence upon your heart. And God convicting you of your sin and, and you're seeing the goodness of God because that's what led you to repent in the first place because of God's goodness. Not God's wrath, but God's goodness. And that led us to repentance. The goodness, the goodness of God leadeth to repentance, not to be repented of. So God's goodness is what brings people to Him, not fear. And, and that's why I'm troubled about those who, and I'm not saying it can't happen, but when a person, a lot of times you'll show up, we've heard movies like Left Behind or what have you, and, and people say, I'm going to get saved, I don't want to be left behind. Well, we need to uh, make our calling and election sure, because in regard to my salvation, was I saved because I was afraid, or was I saved because 
I saw the goodness of God, I saw myself as a sinner. Or did I just pray a prayer because I don't want to be left behind to go through all this? Of course, that left behind movie is, is a bunch of heresy. But, but nevertheless, you, you see that. I remember when the first one came out in the 70s, left behind. And now they're even getting more perverse in their doctrinal approach. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the point is, when you show something scary in guillotines and people getting their heads cut off, people say, I'm not going to be left behind. I'm, what do I need to do to be saved? Pray a prayer. Okay, boom, I prayed my prayer. I'm saved. Well, I'm glad I'm not going to be left behind. And that they go on and live their life the way they live and nothing changed. But here we need to understand God didn't choose to save you that way. God chose to save you by His goodness. The goodness of God leadeth to repentance. And the repentance is, is there a repentance in there where a person said, yeah, I prayed a prayer, but did I really change? Was there a repentance of sin? Was I sorry for my sin and understanding why Jesus died for my sin? Or am I just looking for a quick fire insurance policy? So I wonder sometimes, a lot of folks are saved that way. I'm not saying they can't be saved. I'm just saying according to the scripture that, that we look at, the, the goodness of God, and this is the election according to grace. That God has chosen the divine influence, His divine influence upon your heart. Not trying to scare you with gargoyles and demonic creatures, but God's divine influence upon your heart. And we see ourselves as sinners and we know that Jesus died for the sin debt. So we, we have to make our calling and election sure. And and then with that being said, we have those who can fail of the grace of God. Saved or not. Now we have a lost person that fails of the grace of God. Now the grace of God, God will not always strive with man. But yet man can fail of the grace of God or that divine influence now becomes, uh, it comes up against a calloused heart and to the point where nothing will penetrate anymore. And this is where the day of visitation is sinned away. And a person now, uh, his fate is sealed. Not that God chose it, but they did through the hardness of the heart. As with Pharaoh, his heart was hardened. So he did not, like Pharaoh did not yield to the divine influence upon his heart. He hardened it. And this is where a person fails of the grace of God. Then we have a believer who can fail of the grace of God. Look in verse uh, 15 again. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the divine influence of God upon his heart. Lest, because here's the colon giving the explanation, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled, lest there be a fornicator, sexual sin, or profane person going against that which they loved and stood for at one time. Or Esau, materialism, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. So three options come from those who fail of God's divine influence upon their heart. Sexual sins, that's lust of the flesh. You have uh, material sins, where he sold his birthright for a bowl of soup. So you have materialism, and uh, then you have uh, uh, a profanity. And that's, uh, you have the lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, which is materialism and uh, the pride of life. Then we're coming into the profanity where you, you just go against it now. Your heart is hardened. So you have three areas here that are affected. And this is where, when a man fails of the grace of God. Now we have to understand that election, election of grace. So God has chosen the process according to not your works. Again, for by grace, God's divine influence upon your heart, are you saved through faith, which God gives you as a gift. Not your works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2 dovetails perfectly with Romans 11. They go together. So we see the, the aspect of this Calvinism teaching is, in reality, Calvinism is a work-based thing. It, it's an after the fact when you look at it the way it, it is in the Scripture. So now when we look at the... Um, uh, that subject concerning this, where Esau fell in those areas. Any questions or comments on that? Yes, we got one here. 
Yeah, that's a good point. Okay, what? Yes. And it's a choice, uh, and it's uh, it's the heart. It goes back to the heart. What the Bible says, you've resisted the Holy One. So it's a resistance, and that's a choice, a resistance against God's divine influence. So you resist that, and they've resisted the Holy One of Israel. They resisted Christ. They resist the Holy Ghost. You stiff-necked people. And, uh, so we're, uh, and what you have said there in John 3, where men love darkness rather than light, and so you have the condemnation uh, there where you have those that receive the light. And, and by the way, when they acknowledge their sin, they come to the light and they get more light. So this is the grace that's multiplied through knowledge. And uh, so when you see that there in John 3... Actually, uh, let's, go, let's go there in John 3 and verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man uh, be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now these are very familiar. Now we look at God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. And by the way, John... Um, let's see here, John chapter uh, 1, we know that um, the law was given by Moses in verse 17, but what came by Jesus Christ? Look in John 1, 17, what came by Jesus Christ? Grace, grace and truth, All right? So grace and truth, grace here is charisma, that is a gift, that's God's divine influence upon the human heart. So grace came by Jesus. So he came not into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him, through this divine influence upon the human heart, but not all would receive it. So we have to understand the process by which man is saved. He is not saved according to his works. He is not saved according to baptism. He's not saved according to communion. He is not saved according to church membership. He is not saved according to anything but what God deems as, number one, the man is going to come to him it's going to be according to his divine influence upon that man's heart. Now, that man can say no to that. He can resist the Holy One of Israel. And man does. But, but what God has chosen in regard to election is grace. That's what God has chosen. Divine influence. And, and that is what God has chosen. That, that brings to light in John chapter 3 now, verse uh, 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that has come. Light has come into the world, which is Christ. Light, knowledge. And men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds are evil. And everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest their deeds should be reproved. So what Laura was saying is that if a, person is, if a person looks at election as God chose this person to be saved and this person not to be saved, then God is the author of darkness and God is the author of, uh, well, we have uh, darkness there and, and darkness and sin, which we know that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. And, and so we see this. And so we have a uh, verse 21, it says, But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought in God. So if you do too, so grace and truth came by Jesus. So the divine influence upon the human heart, number one, grace, who does grace and truth, now you have truth. So you have to have grace to do the truth. Now this is what God hath elected. It's the process by which he saves man, not the man who saved his election. Election is the process by which God determined to save men.
And it's a, it, man cannot, see everything about election is outside the scope of man's ability. Man cannot create God's divine influence upon his heart. Man can work, but God said that ain't going to work because that's not what I elected. I elected two things, grace and truth. And you have to have divine influence upon your heart to receive the truth. And if you love darkness, you're not going to be able to see the truth. And this is where repentance comes in. Because 2 Timothy 2.25, preventure God give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. You must have repentance in order to see the truth. Because here it says that uh, he that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be reproved. He doesn't hide them. He brings them out and he deals with them. And the more he deals with them, the more he, his calling and election is sure. So now he is yielding more and more to that divine influence upon his heart. Everything about it is God's divine influence upon us. And so that's where that lands. I, you know, to me, it's quite clear. That, then we understand that um, uh, election is according to the foreknowledge of God that uh, we know who will yield to this divine influence upon the heart, who will not. God knows that. His, his foreknowledge is also part of the equation. Any other questions? Randy. If you can't work for salvation, you can't work to keep your salvation. That's right. If you don't work for salvation, why is it you work to keep it? Very good point. And, and that's so true. Now that's according to grace. And in God's gift. But now Arminians and uh, Calvinism, see, they use a lot of the same terminology. Now, I mentioned where the, the teaching comes from in regard to you keep your salvation, then you can lose it. And people like to buttonhole you and say, well, you're either a Calvinist or you're an Arminian. You are one or the other, and that's all there is. I'm sorry, I'm not either. I'm a Baptist, and, and we believe a little differently. And uh, you all are state church, you come from Augustine, you're Catholics, you're part of the whore of the Revelation, and so really, you all are twisted and, uh, in where you're from and your whole, your whole premise and your whole idea, uh, and don't try to buttonhole us and say we're one or the other. But Arminians, Arminius was a Calvinist as well. He was 75 years, if I remember right, after Calvin, and, and he believed Again, salvation's in the church. That's where it all comes from. Salvation's in the church. And, that, and by the way, a lot of this, uh, these uh, stems that, of doctrine come away from Augustinianism, even in our Baptist churches, where people today believe in the church is universal and invisible. And when you're saved, you're automatically, by the Spirit of God, baptized into a church. So that, that is Calvinism. That is Augustinian teaching. That is Catholicism. And Baptists are embracing that. We believe the church is independent, local, and visible, and it's a body of baptized believers. That's what the church is. It, you're, you're not saved into it. When a person is saved, they're part of the family of God. But Calvinism and Augustine, uh, Augustinianism, as well as Lutherans, they believe that in order to be saved, you've got to be baptized, and that places you into the body, which is the church. They call the body of Christ, and that's where salvation is. And perpetually you have communion to, uh, for the forgiveness of sin, and that maintains salvation. But once you leave that, if you walk out from that, you'll lose your salvation. But that makes you part of the Roman Empire, the state church. So you've got to stay in. Now that's a works-based salvation. And, and that is not according to what election of grace is. That is works. You're saved by works here. And yet they'll say, Calvin... Uh, Augustine was a good man, and you know they'll teach that in Baptist colleges downstate. They were teaching at one preacher that I know was saying Cal uh, Augustine was a good man. Really, maybe you ought to talk to um, a Patillon who got who was killed by Augustine, and, and all the Donatists in Carthage, Africa. A good man, huh? And well, they believe that nonsense. But uh, in regard to losing the salvation, that's where that comes from. So we don't believe in a church saves anybody. We believe by the divine influence of God. He works upon our heart. We repent of sin. He, everything is a gift from God. From the grace to faith to repentance, it's all a gift. God gives it to us. And that's what God hath chosen. That's what God has elected. Nothing to do with us except yes. And he gives us the ability to repent. It all goes back to that divine influence upon the human heart. I, I'm, I'm tired of saying that's God's influence. And I want to repent of this. That's God's influence. 
and that is grace. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So God had taken it out of the court of man, and God had put it upon himself the way he would save people. So that's how it is done. Any other questions? Randy. Uh, that is Antichrist. Uh, good question there in John. They went out from us because they were not of us. If they were of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. This is the spirit of Antichrist. So the Antichrist comes out of the church, doesn't come out of the UN, it comes out of the church, and that's where uh, corruption of doctrine comes in. So uh, Calvinism is an Antichrist doctrine. Uh, it is a corrupt doctrine. And... Uh, and so that's, that's part of it because that was all part of, the, of Rome and the papacy and the whole idea behind a federal church system. So that is Antichrist teaching. So yes, indirectly they are connected. Uh, but it is, that is the spirit of Antichrist, I guess I would call that, Calvinism, because it's all part of supporting a federal church system which came from Rome. And that is the spirit of Antichrist, if nothing else. But yes, it came out of the church. And so they always use... Cults always use uh, the Bible, they use doctrine, and you could have, uh, you have a lot of truth with what they say, but then they inject the error. And if it was all error, no one would believe it, but you have to have truth with it. But there's always injected with error, and that's what makes it bad. So, any other questions? All right, well, we didn't go to the lesson at all, but uh, I hope it was helpful this morning. But let's go ahead and... Uh, uh, stop and we'll come back to the top of the hour. So.